I turn on the microphone, right? Uh, I want to, uh, actually I was bragging about you this week uh, because I was telling a, a pastor friend of mine, hey, guess what? In our budget in the church at Peter's Road Baptist Church, we have $2,000 for benevolence. In other words, for giving out to people who need the money. And this whole year, we haven't spent one penny of it. And so the pastor friend says, you got a stingy church, Lem. <laughs> you guys haven't given out anything. And I said, no, that's because we've given out almost $5,000 that have come as voluntary offerings from the membership. And so I want to thank you for that. That's amazing. That's amazing. We've been able to help. If you only knew for reasons of privacy, I cannot tell you. But if you only knew how many people we have helped. It's, I mean, it's amazing. It's incredible. And so today we're going to talk about uh, fatherhood because obviously it's what? It's Father's Day. And, and I've always been an advocate of Father's Day because we made such a big hoopla about Mother's Day. Woo, Mother's Day. And then Father's Day, like Pelegi said, eh, you know. And so uh, we had this little game and it goes to show you that everybody worries about what mama likes. Nobody worries about what daddy likes, huh? I mean, how can you forget Picadillo? Anyways, we're going to go down that line. Uh, just know that fatherhood is not a game. Fatherhood is not. Can you say that with me? Fatherhood is not a game. Unfortunately, in this society that we live in, uh, fatherhood has been denigrated and made into a game of chance almost. Uh, it's almost a, a charade, okay? Being a sperm donor is easy. Being a father is not easy. Now, some people think that being a father is just a game. But it's not. The father is the keystone of the home. If his piece is missing for any reason, the home will suffer. Now, there are sobering statistics. And I actually, I mean, you know, I, I went off the deep end. Uh, I, I decided to go look up uh, issues of fatherhood in modern society, and I spent literally a whole day looking and reading articles, and I must have read at least 50 articles. And there are sobering statistics to support my case that fatherhood is not a game. For many, and this is a quote from the seventh edition of Father Facts Research Study, for many of our most intractable social ills affecting children, and there's a list of a bazillion of them. Father absence is to blame. The lack of religious upbringing and nurture falls at the feet of fathers that are either absent or negligent. Those are the rats up there. <laughs> and so uh, it's fathers that are either absent or negligent to help their children find a righteous path. Now, let me give you just a couple of examples of statistics so that you know that I'm not lying. In America, 26.6% of the children, now in America, 26.6% of the children is 17.4 million children. It would take us a while to count these, okay? They lived in father absent homes in 2014. And this is in 2014. For the years after 2014, 15, 16, 17, 18, the statistics trend higher and higher. That's not good. In a study of 3,197 fathers from the Fragile Families and Child Well-Being study, examined father identity and involvement patterns. And the study found, it's almost like stating the obvious, father involvement was found to decrease over time. In other words, as social issues go up with children, father involvement has what? got down in time and so in other words fathers are having less and less influence in the lives of their families did you hear that fathers are having less and less now this may not be because they want to man i hate being with my kids i'd rather do something by myself that's not the case it's usually that they're working and they're working two and three jobs or sometimes they're having to deal with issues that uh the children just happen to be in a lower priority bracket the fact is that parental influence in many cases, on the side of the father, is absent in many homes. And so this is why I have this, okay? I love this. This is, I, I got this stick from North Carolina, and it's really amazing. I mean, <laughs> it's a good staff. Okay, so I'm using this as the staff 
of paternal authority. So this is the staff of paternal authority. Now what I want to convey to you is that you can be a father without the staff. No, he's not going to turn to a snake. Okay. Uh, so you can be a father without any paternal authority. But I believe that if you're going to be a father, you have to have this. You have to have paternal authority. And so today, we're going to look in detail at the most popular and known passage in an amazing book in the Bible, which you already know what it is. Yes? Joshua. All right. And so we're going to look at the most popular passage in the whole book of Joshua. Okay? How many chapters does Joshua have? Question. Huh? 24, and today we're going to be reading from the 24th chapter, which we already did. And you've probably seen it posted in signs and in many Christian and Jewish homes. And I'm referring to the passage from Joshua 24, 14, and 15. It's a famous passage, and it ends like this. As for me and my house, I think that the stick has something to do with the box of cables under here. Because <laughs> every time I go like this, something happens. Anyways. Uh, the, the idea is that as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Now, if you go to my house, you'll see it in several places. If you go to my office, you'll see it in several places. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. So open your Bible there in Joshua chapter 24, because we're actually going to come back to those two verses. And we're going to see uh, some key words that stand out from this passage. All right. Joshua 24 is Joshua's last speech to the people. So Joshua, remember how we started chapter 1? Be strong and courageous, Joshua. You're going to lead the people to the promised land. Well, now Joshua is about to walk into his grave. He's 110 years old. This is the end of the road for Joshua. And so he gives his last farewell speech to the people. It's a memorable model. And he gives it at Shechem. Now, you remember from past sermons that Shechem is the place that in chapter 9, after the battle in Ai, all of the people walked to Shechem where the curses and the blessings over the people were pronounced. So Shechem was a holy place. It was a place for meeting God and worshiping Him. It was a covenant making place it was a deal making place so they went to Shechem, and made a deal with god and so now joshua brings the people back to the same place where they originally made a deal with god and so joshua shows himself as the patriarch as the father of his generation of israelites okay now uh it's it's a pretty big responsibility to be paternal to have paternal authority for a whole nation. And as the father of his people, he shows us a great example of fatherhood and how a father should act. So what exactly do I mean? Well, first of all, Joshua shows us that a good father, number one, worships the one true God. Worships the one true God. Elohim Yahweh Adonai, Elohim, the God, the one whose name is unpronounceable, my Lord. And so here it begins by Joshua saying, fear the Lord. And so a good father fears, but I'm not talking about being scared, like, you know, I'm talking about reverence. It's the, the fear of awe. So you're reverencing the Lord Jehovah. Fear is used as a synonym for respect, for reverence, or awe. Now, one of the words that people overuse today, it's almost become a cliche, is what? Awesome, yeah. Hey, what did you think of that steak? Man, it was awesome. Eh? And so, hey, what did you think of this? Football game. Oh, it was awesome. And so we have used awesome so much that it doesn't mean anything anymore. And, and, but, but what it means is someone who is to be feared because they are great. And so here, the, the word that appears as, as worship, okay, and, and we see this, this little word. It says, therefore, fear the Lord and worship. Uh, worship him. Literally, the word is serve. Serve the Lord. So when you worship, you serve the Lord. And the Hebrew word is evit. It's one of the most beautiful words in the, in the Old Testament, evit. And it appears seven times in these two little verses. Now, figure it out, okay? Fear the Lord and what? 
Worship him, okay? Get rid of the gods your ancestors worshipped, okay? And worship the Lord. But if it doesn't please you to worship yourselves, the one you will worship, your father's worship, as for me and my family, we will worship. So take those two little verses in your Bible and put a circle around each time you see the word worship. Literally, and in Spanish, it comes out as serve, okay? It's a verb to serve. And so the service, okay, you, you know, that's why we call this the service, okay? We come here because when we serve God, we're worshiping him. And so what it means is that we are working we are cultivating a relationship. We are performing a ritual that will bring a result, okay? And so this service or worship is done with what? Joshua says, fear the Lord and worship him. How? In sincerity and in truth. In sincerity and in truth. What that means is in integrity, okay? Uh, integrity is sincerity, totally devoted. There's a loyalty that's a one mind, okay? It, it, it's just devoted to this one thing, and then it's loyal, okay? It's loyal. It's there today, it's there tomorrow, it's there the next day. It, 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 it's a commitment to be there no matter what. And then truth, and what truth means is in reality, in God's reality. There's no double-mindedness. In other words, this is the real Thing. And I'm not talking about Coca-Cola. I'm talking about how God relates with us in truth. And so the one who worships the one true God must serve him in integrity and in truth. And one of the things that I want you to understand is that to serve God is not a two-way street. Okay? To serve God is not a two-way street. What's a two-way street? Go that way, and the other ones come this way, and sometimes we're going, and sometimes we're coming. No, it's a one-way street. It is the complete commitment of the totality of one's life. The servant of God, the worshiper of God, exists only for the service of God. God is either Lord of all, or he's not Lord at all, okay? So there's no 50% or 60%. There's no cutting, okay? It's either God is Lord of all or he's not Lord at all. And, and, and so we think that we can, you know, work it out with God. There's no working out. It's all or nothing. It's an all or nothing proposition. There's no middle ground in the service of God. Jesus himself said that you cannot serve two masters. You will love one and hate the other one. But you can't serve two masters at the same time. My son is going to the Air Force. And it's funny because uh, the first year recruits, when they go into the Air Force Academy, they're called dooleys. Dooleys. And I thought, well, that's pretty cool, dooleys. And so dooley Mark. I mean, so I'm making fun of Mark and, you know. Uh, it, but then I decided, what the heck does dooley mean? So I'm reading all these books about the Air Force. Do you know where they got that from? From the Greek word in the New Testament that means servant which is doulos now doulos is a servant who is a committed or what you call a servant that's committed it's called a slave and so they call them doulies slaves because they have to do everything that the upper classmen or their cadres tell them to do think about this now we laugh because we believe that's part of a military tradition. But what if we do this in this church? What if I called you a dooley? And what if I said you're under a loyalty oath to be obedient? Ah, I don't know about that. Well, th this is what a father is supposed to be before God. Joshua shows us that a good father worships the one true God. Also, Joshua shows us that a good father does not worship God idols does not worship false gods and so you look at the passage okay and it says get rid of the gods your ancestors worship get rid you know it's not like put away okay put away that, that's very passive you know what it's saying put it in the trash throw it away throw it away and so we worship god and then we throw away the idols. We throw away all the trash of the false religions, all the trash of the things that bind us 
to this world. And so it says, the idols beyond the river. The river is the Euphrates. It's still there. If you look at the map. That your father served. Your distant ancestors. And so the pagan gods of Mesopotamia. This idea of, of, of paganism that is embedded in the stories of your family. It, it pops back up in the Bible. And the idea uh, that Joshua is stressing is the old idols. And I'm talking about, remember the story of Laban and, and of Rachel and the teraphim. And Laban, Laban had a fit because she stole his household gods. This is the things we're talking about. There had been an issue in Israel for a long time. Bad habits die hard and take a long time to go away. Sometimes we learn bad things and they keep on going from generation to generation to generation. And so we have to stop these, okay? Um, the, the idea that comes to my mind is uh, Alcoholics Anonymous. Now, I hope that you don't have to do that, but as one of the courses that I took in graduate school, I did an in-depth study of Alcoholics Anonymous. And, and, and one of the things you find out is that alcoholics have to battle the demons of alcoholism every single day. Day. Now, later on, I found out that it's not just alcoholism, it's any addiction. Any addiction, you have to battle every day. And so when you go to an AA meeting, you know, when you go to speak, the first thing you say is what? Hi, my name's David. I'm an alcoholic. Now, it could be that you've been 20 years sober, but you're still in your system. It's still that root of addiction and so the same thing is true for false religions we fall in the trap all the line all the time and so we have to come out and say hey i'm david i'm an idolater now what's your poison and it could be anything uh, i mean we don't worship little stone things but we worship little green papers isn't that funny huh we come oh yeah i would never never bow down to some little stone thing but we bow down to a little green thing that waves, huh? Or is it your computer that's got you addicted? I mean, some people can't breathe without their phone being on. If the phone goes off, their lungs go off. And, and I don't know how they're going to survive. And so you have to deal with these things, okay? And so a good father does not worship idols, uh, the, the, the idols from Egypt. And so he goes and he says, hey, not only the idols of the of the of the, the people beyond the Euphrates, uh, but, but what about the ones that your fathers worshipped in Egypt, okay? And so this was the false religion of the Jewish immigrants in Egypt. So they go to Egypt, and instead of changing Egypt, they're changed by Egypt. And so you have Ra, Anubis, Osiris, Toth, Horus, Seth. Isis, Bastet, Amon, and a bazillion other gods. Take your pick. There were frogs. There were alligators. There were falcons. There were the sun, the moon. You name it. Claim your God and worship. Okay? Now, this is what the, the, the Egyptians want to make sure that they had every god covered. Okay? Every god was covered. Okay? And so they wanted... The Jews, they wanted to conform to their new land, and there's no easier way to assimilate than to worship the same gods and the same false religion. Joshua knew that this was still the case for Israel. With the people of Israel, after all they'd been through, they had been you know, liberated through the exodus of, of the ten plagues in Egypt. They had gone through the Red Sea through dry land they had been supported for 40 years in the wilderness and these people still snuck around and worshiped the gods from egypt can you believe that yes you believe it because we do it all the time okay we also worship the gods of the places where we've been we worship the God of the places where we've been, okay? And as if that's not enough, then you have the idols of the Amorites around you. These were the new fads of the false religions that they faced daily themselves. This was the greener grass, you know? The grass is always greener where? On the other side, okay? These idols were all related to sexual rights and practices intended to appease the idols Baal and his concert Asherah. These idols of fertility were worshipped in immoral but fun ways. 
when you read the ways that these people worship, you're going, oh, my Lord, there were raves. I mean, this was bacchanalias. Uh, this was, and all in the name of worship, of fertility, all in the name of doing the right thing for the land. And, and so a lot of people got, you know, enthusiastic about this kind of thing. And, and so Joshua is saying, you got to get rid of this. These rituals and idols captivate the hearts of the people of God. And so a good father like Joshua throws away these evil idols and their immoral practices. A good father knows that the worship of idols leads to corruption. And it leads to the destruction of the individual, the family, and the nation. And finally, Joshua shows us that a good father leads, okay? I love that this is for leading, okay? It leads his family to worship God. He says, me and my house, me and my bet, Av. The, literally, what it means is not just my house. It's the house of my father. It's the basic social unit of Israelite society at that time. And it's not just the nuclear family. We're used to the nuclear family. This is a phenomenon of modern society. From the 60s on, we became the nuclear family. But before, how many of you remember? I mean, I remember in Cuba, when my family came for Christmas, my family came for Christmas. I mean, you're talking about 50, 60 people. And you don't well, even know these people. Now we're all spread out all over the world. But it wasn't like that. And so Joshua is talking to his clan, okay? And he says, my children and their children and their children. Now remember, Joshua is how old? He's about 110 years old. And so he's got a bunch of people that claim his name. He says, all of these people, my family, the ones that I'm responsible for, the ones that I have authority for, we will worship the Lord. He makes a clear and unambiguous choice. Joshua, as the patriarch, the father of his family, made the choice for all of them. Now, can you imagine doing that? If we did that in my family, hey, dad, you don't have the right to tell me what to believe. That's exactly what I'm talking about. We don't have what? The authority. And so, this is one of the few places in the Old Testament where Israel had to make a definite choice in a defining moment. And this choice was breathtaking. Normally, now think about this. Think about this. Normally, who did the choosing? And don't say the mom. Who did the choosing? God. God chose the people. God chose the path. I mean, when you go through Joshua, it's God leading the people on. Well, uh, what do we do? There's, there's a sea. Oh, well, hey, sit back, relax, watch my power. And so God opens the sea. Oh, we're in the desert. We got nothing to eat. Hey, hey, sit back. So God is leading them. God is providing. They get to the promised land. What are we going to do? Cross the Jordan. I'm going to stop the water. What are we going to do? The city's got walls. Okay, don't worry about it. The walls are going to come down. Well, look, we lost the battle. Don't worry about it. Repent. We'll take care of it. Ah! God is always choosing. But here, things change. Now the people have to make the choice to choose God. Isn't that incredible? How can that even happen? If I was God, I'd just say, <laughs> yeah, that's not going to happen. But God is a good father. And he gives us the opportunity to choose God. And so surprisingly, the pagan idolaters, they didn't have to choose anything because they could choose any God they desired. Oh, look, there's a bug. We're going to worship the bug. Look. And then you could laugh and say, yeah, that's stupid. How can you worship a bug? I worship a cow. You know, and so Israel had to commit and choose only one, the one true God or one of the many false gods around them. Now, eh, you know, don't think Israel was out there. Today, we have this funny little philosophy called pluralism. And pluralism means that anything goes. As long as you don't hurt me, you can do whatever you want. Okay. So you want to have a stick? Stick it at your head, that's fine, you know. Whatever you want, whatever floats your boat, okay? And, and, and so if, if you want to do this and do this and do that and then go to church and be part of a Christian family, that's fine. Why not? 
You can do whatever you want. We're a pluralistic society. We believe in toleration. And so when it goes to my family, all of my kids, it doesn't matter how old they are, they can choose. So three-year-old Johnny wants to eat macaroni and cheese every single day. Hey, Johnny, that's okay. Go for it, man. Knock yourself out. But it's not just macaroni and cheese. Later on, Johnny decides that he's going to choose his life. And we have nothing to say. We have given up. We have lost what? This. And so whenever a father comes and says, I'm the dad. They say, yeah, but it's a pluralistic society. Oh. And wait till I get to become 18 years old when I leave this house. I mean, that's what my dad used to tell me. Yeah, when you're a man, you can do whatever you want. But here, this is my house. Here, this is what we believe. Here, this is what we eat. Here, this is what we do. If you want to do something else. And so, today, we have to choose the Lord that has chosen us and succeed or choose the gods of the land and perish and disappear as a family and as a nation. And this is what's happening. Everything's falling apart. The wheels have come off the cart and we're wondering why nothing is getting done or we're not getting anywhere. Okay, now, this is exactly what Rahab did. Remember Rahab the harlot? Now, I thought about it because, man, it's Father's Day. I don't want to use in a paternal authority sermon a woman. But Rahab, she chose the one true God of Israel and rejected all the other false gods of her people in Jericho. I mean, she just blew them away. And she gives us the example. And so Joshua laid out the choice for Israel, but he did not. Now notice, I like the way Joshua did it. He didn't threaten them. He didn't try to coerce them. Hey, you're stupid if you don't pick this. No, he didn't say that. The choice was simple. And he gave himself as the example. He said, today, you get to choose. Choose whoever you want to worship. You can worship the God of the Amorites. Or you can worship Jehovah, the one true God. As for me. As for me. In the house that has my name, we're going to worship the Lord. I don't know what you're going to do. I don't know what you're going to choose. But as for me, in my house, we will worship the Lord. The choice was simple. And he set his own life as an example of the choice. And so this is exactly what I'm doing today. This is exactly what I'm doing right now. The writer of Deuteronomy in chapter 10 verse 12 says and now Israel what does the Lord your God ask of you except to fear the Lord your God by walking in all his ways to love him and to worship the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul fathers those that are present today here those that are watching on the internet we must choose we must choose. And so I challenge you today to choose. How we choose as fathers will determine the future of our families and their families and their families in their destiny with God. How we choose will determine if God is with us and for us or whether God is not with us and against us how we choose matters so we need to choose wisely now one of the things that calls my attention always is that um, in the old testament god is not referred to as father he's just awesome you fear the lord god but jesus came to show us the father and he even said it hey i've come so that you can see the father and, and so Philip comes and says, Jesus, show us the Father. <laughs> and Jesus says, Philip, I've been with you all this time and you still didn't figure it out. I and the Father am one. So Jesus comes to show us the human face of God. And so he presents to us a loving Father who wants to have a relationship with us, who wants the best for us. 
And so God, our loving Father, has chosen us. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. He invites us today to choose him for us, for our families. We need fathers that are strong and courageous. Like Joshua, that step out into the gap and choose God. And choose to hold in their hand the staff of paternal authority. Now, what's the easiest thing to do? And so I can put it on the mother, and then the mother has to carry all this weight. Or I can put it on the children, and you can see the children trying to figure out what the heck they're going to do. Or we can grab it and take it. And be the ones that lead our families. And become fathers that choose to serve God in integrity and truth. I can't demand from my children that they serve the God in integrity and in truth if I'm not doing that. And so we have to bring integrity and truth to our lives. And then we have to be fathers that choose to throw away all the idols. Throw it away. Throw it away. Throw it away. And you know what I'm talking about. There's a list of a bazillion things. A bazillion things. Throw it away. That's what the Bible says. The idols of materialism. The idols of pleasure. The idols of worldly significance. I remember one day, my dad says, hey, we got to go get a haircut. I said, okay, dad. And so he says, we're going to go pick up your brother. Okay. So we get in the car and we go to the middle school. And there's my brother coming out and he's got a cigarette. <laughs> I'm going, oh, this is going to be good. <laughs> and so my dad, my brother didn't know we were going to wait for him. I'm going, oh, man, this guy's walking into a trap. He did. And then he almost ate the cigarette. And my dad said, no, nobody. So my dad drove us to the, the corner, the little carton carry store. You know, one of those little Mickey Mouse stores. And he goes up there and he says, I want to buy a carton of cigarettes. And, and so the guy goes, what do you want? He goes, whatever. He goes, Marlboro, Marlboro. And so then he gives my, my brother. <laughs> my brother was in sixth grade. He gives him the thing. He says, come on, let's go home. So we go to the house. He sits in the backyard and he says, all right, open your box. Take it out. Smoke it. Smoke the whole pack. Be a man. Don't smoke it over there. Smoke it over here. My brother, okay, let's turn it on. <laughs> Light the thing. Now, smoke. Go smoke. <laughs> I don't think my brother ever smoked anything after that. <laughs> but the statement was made. I never saw my father smoke one cigarette or cigar my whole life. And I have never smoked anything because of the example that he set. And I saw that he was serious about it. And so what I'm saying is I stand before you as a father that has chosen to follow the example of Joshua. As a father that has chosen to say as for me and my house... I'm going to worship the one true God. I'm going to put away the idols that sink us down. And I'm going to lead my family to worship God. And if we do that, then we will be able to live and to thrive and succeed in the promised land that God has given us. And so how do you end something like this? I mean, I can't just leave and say, okay, well, do the best you can. Nah. -uh. I'm going to ask all of the fathers here to come right here, right here. Now, I'm not going to force you. I'm going to do the Joshua thing. Uh, you get to pick. You get to pick. But I can pray for you. So I'm going to ask all of the fathers that are here, keep social distancing, wear your mask, get over here. Being a father is not easy. Being a father is not easy. And, and I'm not going to go into that, but there's, I mean, there's mothers that take away the staff of authority from a father. And that's not right either. And then there are children that take it up. Uh, I mean, 
we're screwed up. And so we need godly men. We need guys like you to stand up and say, I'm going to take the staff of paternal authority. And I'm going to exercise it. Now, it's not easy. I have to admit, it's not easy. Okay? And my kids are always pointing that out to me. You're a hypocrite. You're a hypocrite. You said this. (laughs) Yeah, right. Okay. And so sometimes you just have to say, I'm still the dad. I mean, yesterday I had one of my kids call me and say, I'm going to go buy platanos to cook. And I said, no, you ain't. I'm still the dad. You're not doing that. (laughs) Stand down. (laughs) And so I'm going to pray for, for you guys, my fellow fathers. And you need to make the choice. Now you make that choice in your heart as for me. In my house, we will serve the Lord. And believe me when I tell you that the same, I can can just feel what Joshua felt. And is knowing that God is with us, that God is for us. Yesterday I was in the car driving with my wife and I'm telling her, man, we are so blessed. And so we started listing all the blessings that God has given us that we could remember. And we were there for a long time. Look look, look, look at this, remember this, remember this. Yeah, yeah, God is with us. Now, in the home, the father is the keystone. Obviously, you need the mother. Obviously, each child has a way. But, so where you are, I'm going to ask you to stand. And we're going to pray for our dads. Because it's not easy being a dad. And it's not a game. It's not a game. Father God, we come before you in the spirit of Joshua. What a man. What an example of a father to his family and to his nation. I can only imagine Joshua, an old man, standing before the millions of Israel and saying, You do whatever you want. But as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. Father, thank you for giving me the opportunity years ago to decide that I would serve you, that I would put away the idols of the false religion all around me and that I would would lead my family to worship you. Thank you, Father, because you have honored that choice by blessing my life and the life of my family. And so just like Joshua and just like me, Lord, I pray for these fathers who are here next to me with the weight of the responsibility of their family on their shoulders. Father, I pray that they can pick up the staff of paternal authority and exercise it in their home and lead their families to worship you in integrity and in truth. Father, This is our prayer today. Lord Joshua presented the choice in such a way that respected the rights of everyone around him. Because that's how you did it. When you gave Joshua the right, you didn't force him. You let him choose. And Joshua let the people choose. And today, Father, we're letting every father choose. But may they choose wisely. Lord, lead each father here today to choose you like you chose us. Father, I pray for all of the fathers that are watching us through their online connection. May they also make the right choice. Lead them to choose you and that they and their children and their children's children and the children of those children can be a part of that glorious family through you. We thank you because you are our Father and you chose us. Thank you, Father God, for being a great example and for putting people around us that can help us to be the best fathers that we can be. We commit to you In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, and through your spirit and the people of God said, 
you and a thousand generations and your family and your children and the children of their children. May his favor be upon you and a thousand generations and your family and your children and their children and their children. May his favor be upon you and a thousand generations and your family and your children and their children and their children may his favor be upon you and a thousand generations and your family and your children
on now. Come on. Let's give God the glory. Come on, church. So, church, I want to let you know that if you've made a decision to follow Christ and you have not let us know, let us know. Let us know. Let me know. Let Pastor Lemma know. The easiest way to do it is by going to petersworld.org slash connect. But I got to follow up with you. I got to let you know something. You know, as we're coming next week, keep in mind, keep in mind, fathers, that we're praying for you. I'm a father, and it's, it's, it's kind of bizarre saying that. But fathers, we're praying with you. Continue to lead on and be strong. And, hey, as we're leaving, make sure that, you know, don't forget, if you want to give your tithes and offerings, Maria is right over here. And um, keep in mind that we have an 11, 15 a.m. service in Spanish. So you may want to share to, you know, abuelos or abuelos or somebody that only speaks Spanish. So go ahead and make your way. And God bless you. May God keep you. Remember, not only is he with you, he is for you. Here we go.